by age, an actual number this time. Yeah. You know, speaking as a man, um, there's, I think there's, there's very few things that are as impactful and as powerful as someone taking the courage and the step forward like you did, Ken, to be vulnerable and be real and be emotional. We live in a society and culture that is wrong, that is dictated by a man needs to be a man, he not, needs to not feel any emotion, and men don't cry, and I say that's BS. Nope. BS. <laughs> you got to go more than that. But the problem is, is when we actually step out of that and to be real, and the fact that I saw Dave and Wes and so many people surround you instantly, that is, that's amazing. And, and, and I want to give you commendation for, for stepping up and just saying, listen, I need help in this, Lord. And being real, not sugarcoating it and saying, oh, God is good, even when you don't feel that, but, but saying God is good, but I'm still right here. You know, and that's, that's huge. So I want to thank you for that, Ken. Thank you. And I will be praying for you, and I can't wait to hear the other end of that testimony. I guess it's appropriate that. Oh, sorry, please. We I was... also need to send forth some prayers for our youngest daughter who has sprained both of her ankles and one of them was caused when he needs surgery. So, prayers that she will have the patience to save <coughs> off her legs and also that God would use this for good in her life. What's her name? Nadia. Nadia. Lord Jesus, right now, as a community, we want to come before you, Lord, and intercede on behalf of Nadia, Jesus, and lift her up to you. God, you are the ultimate healer, Lord, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we just lift her up to you right now that you'll just give her peace of mind, Lord God, and courage and just calmness and the ability to rest and heal, Lord, and that you will guide the doctors and guide the process of using them and blessing them to bless her and heal her and set things right that have gone wrong in her ankles, Lord. But I also pray that this will be an opportunity for her to connect with you and hear from you, Lord, that she will use this opportunity to really internalize and seek you and hear your voice, Lord, because you are very good at grabbing us at some of our lowest points and building us up to our highest heights, Lord. And let this be a character moment. Let this be a spiritual moment. Let this be a moment of your presence and her seeking your face, Lord God, and blessing all others around her with her testimony of what you are doing and who she's becoming in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess it's appropriate then that the first question I'm asking in my sermon this morning is, is Jesus limited? No. And now it's, but it's, it's easy to say that, but when you're in a difficult situation, sometimes it's not easy to know that because your feelings will lead you elsewhere, right? You know, is he limited in the sense of how many moves I can actually do in a physical game of Twister? Right hand red. My left hand's on red. How's my right hand going to go on red? You got like, I got like four good moves in Twister, and then it's like, I'm done. But thankfully, Jesus has a lot more moves in the game of life, doesn't he? But Jesus goes with intention. He does, and he moves, and, and he goes places, and he goes to people on purpose, people that maybe sometimes even people who are following Christ say, I don't know if you should be going there and being with that person or doing this in this way. But Jesus does the impossible with whom he's going to do it with. Jesus' methods won't agree with how we think he should act all the time either. That's the thing about the law. The law tends to compartmentalize and put people in certain places and say you have to act and say and do things just like this. But if Jesus is acting out here and he's doing things that seem obscure or impossible or inappropriate, judging by certain standards that maybe the law sets up, he's not going to be limited by that. His ministry is not to establish a new law. His ministry is to come and set people free. So the question is, are we willing to totally surrender to him, no matter what? See, the story begins with Jesus on a boat trip. 
If you look at the history of the scriptures, a lot of different things happen when Jesus steps on a boat or near a boat. Okay, so his disciples have got to be thinking, oh no, not another boat trip. I, I can't handle you sending us off on our own and then sneaking up, walking on the water and scaring us and we think that you're a ghost. We're like, no, it is I. Ta-da! Jesus, spirit fingers, you know. And then Peter, come to me. And Peter comes and he sinks and he gets pulled up. That's one encounter. Then, then they're on the boat and Jesus is sleeping and you've got this horrific storm and they're like, Jesus, wake up. We're going to die. And he's like, shh, be still. And it calms down. I mean, th this is going to be probably an anxiety-causing moment because when Jesus gets on a boat, something happens. But more than that is when Jesus in Mark chapter 5 steps off of a boat, something happens. There's something powerful about when Jesus is present, things change. There are repercussions for the action of Jesus stepping place presently in any situation. The raging seas will calm. The impossibility of him walking on the water and calling one of his disciples to him, it happens. But in Mark chapter 5, something different. It's something just as life-changing. They came to the other side of the sea. So, so far, so good. They got in the boat. They traveled across the sea, probably very anxiety-ridden, very, very curious as to what was coming next. And they get to the other side and like, yes! But they step into the country of the Gerasenes. And what's interesting about this country is that these people were not Jewish, okay? Culturally, they were more Greek than Jewish in practice, which means this is not the primary destination for a picnic for Jesus and his disciples, okay? Jesus is like, let's go over there, it's sunny. No, Jesus is going somewhere with intention, with purpose, to seek out a moment where he can show up. Jewish people would regularly not associate with non-Jewish people. It was culturally... Mm, that was taboo, especially rabbis. And yet Jesus is saying, let's go over to the other side of the sea where Jewish people normally do not go and associate with people that culturally are less than we are. You know, Jesus went on purpose with intention to a place he culturally shouldn't be, much like the woman at the well, as, Ken, as Derwin spoke about and we had our Bible study a few weeks ago on. Going to places with people that the legalistic religious system of the day said no to. Jesus said, I'll go to. There's a catchphrase for you. Verse 2 says, when he got out of the boat. Okay, this is what Jesus does. This, this is the whole summary of this morning when Jesus went to a place where there was a need which we're coming to and all he did was step out of the boat. His presence showing up had an immediate impact, okay? He steps out of the boat. He doesn't call. He doesn't preach. He steps out of the boat. He shows up. Meaning that when we reflect on Jesus come and we're saying, Lord God, come, are we serious about everything that can possibly come with that? We want it? We say, Lord, yes, come, step out of the boat into my life. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. When he stepped out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. The man met him. When Jesus shows up, things happen. His presence has an effect. The demon, he didn't chase the demon-possessed man from the tombs. And, ah, that, that graveyard there. See the naked guy? I'm going to get him. And he chases after, he kind of hikes up. You know, chases after him, wrestles him to the ground. He wasn't, you know, oh, he's slippery. He's, he's covered in mud and dirt and filth. And, oh, he stinks pretty bad too. And, oh, my me, he's getting away from me. It's not like that. Jesus steps out of the boat and the guy comes to him. Because here's the thing, we cannot help as human beings, whether we are Christians, whether we are atheists, agnostics, or any other religious association, when Jesus shows up, it has an impact to the point of you cannot help but acknowledge I don't mean that literally. I'm not just saying, oh, you know, we had a really great Bible study and I feel pretty good. Isn't it? Jesus, when he shows up, even the demons run towards him, okay? Verse 3 says, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been torn apart by him. And the shackles broken into pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. And yet this man runs to Christ. 
He couldn't be subdued. This, and yet, and yet he runs to meet Jesus. Now think about that. I mean, this is an impressive resume of power on display that he allowed himself time and time again to give these people of this country of Gerasene false hope by saying, oh, you got me, you wrapped me in chains, and then tore them apart to demonstrate his power, his inability to be contained by man, time and time again. And yet he runs to Jesus. This is, this is showing the failed attempts of man opens the door for victory in Jesus and the victory of Jesus. So the thing is, like a lot of times I think as Christians we have this bad uh, rhythm of, of getting down on ourselves. I screwed up. I made a mistake. But the thing is, when we are weak, He is strong. And His grace is enough. Is that not true? But it's not fun in practice either when we feel like we are insufficient. We are trying to run on below the normal percentage of battery and energy and effectiveness. And we feel like, I am not at my best. Jesus says, but I'm always at my best. Let me work through you and in you. This is an opportunity for my victory to be on display. See, the presence of Christ is irresistible. You know, in Scripture, when it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, what I do not believe, what I was taught growing up, is that this will be this, this magnificent coming of Christ, which it will be. But when he stands there, everyone will be able to, they have to. It is, it's like this, this, this forced obedience to bow before Christ. I don't believe that. I believe that when Jesus comes, everyone's going to have this impact by his presence where you're going to not be able to help because you want to be bowed and prostrate before the Lord because this is someone, this is something that brings hope, that brings change, even if we cannot comprehend or understand it. This is something that's having impact on me because he steps out of the boat. Verse 5 says, constantly, night and day, he was screaming amongst the tombs and the mountains, and he was gnashing himself with stones. In other translation, he was cutting himself. Now, I'm not going to try and tie these two things together, but immediately what comes to mind when I think about that is what happens for so many years, especially recently with young people and some older people, of cutting. It's become more out there in the open in the public. And you hear stories of people who have, have taken knives to themselves when they are so depressed and so empty and feel so hopeless that this is the only thing I can control is the pain I'm feeling right now which reminds me I'm alive. And we get the picture of a man who is trapped in his own skin. He was screaming amongst the tombs. He was feeling a prisoner to an authority that was not his own, an authority that had total control over him and everything he did. And he was alone. He was identified by the evil within. Unable to fix himself. Unable to have the people around him fix him. Needing a hero. Needing a savior who would bring life. He was also living in a place that was defined by death. How many people here would want to live in a graveyard? It's a place of rest for the dead. And this is the only place these people could send him because this is the only place they would not be. We've tried, we've failed, go. This is who you are now. You are defined by being isolated, by being rejected, by living amongst the dead because there is nothing worth living in you. His whole existence is defined by death. Not exactly conducive for being alive. But also an opportunity for total life to come in and change separated, quarantined from others because they couldn't subdue or control. They couldn't relate. They couldn't save. So they rejected him and sent him away to suffer alone. And far too often, unfortunately, these are the stories I'm hearing from people who have walked away from church and walked away from Christ. And every time you hear stories about that from someone in my experience, it's never that they had a bad encounter with Jesus. Jesus and this idea of this God who is all loving and all gracious is what drew them to the church in the first place, but it was their encounter with the people that represented him that sent him or her away. But here's the thing. We cannot afford to do this any longer. And I'm not saying us specifically, but I mean the greater global community of the church cannot afford to be this type of example anymore. And it starts with us needing to seek his face and say, Jesus, come and mean it. Not just say the words, 
but comprehend what it could mean. Because here's a man who was crying out for years, unable to be fixed, unable to fix himself, crying out for a change, which he probably thought would never come at this point. With a situation he could not overcome. And maybe the situations in our own lives we cannot overcome on our own. He was sent to the graveyard on the outskirts rather than to Christ. Verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance. Now that we have a little bit of more background on this man. He ran up and he bowed before him. A man with this much power and authority who could not be controlled runs to Christ because he gets out of the boat. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do you have with, with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I, I implore you, by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored Christ, saying, Send us into the swines that we may enter them. But here's the thing. Pigs weren't exactly an ideal great second choice. Okay? But they chose this because torment for the spirits was to lose their position of influence and authority and power over someone else. They said, Lord, God, <laughs> even the demons calling out to him, begging for grace, don't send us out. Send us into those pigs. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out of the unclean spirits, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Now, you've got to think that there's these pigs, and somewhere amongst those pigs is a pig farmer who may or may not be overhearing this conversation and picking up every other word. And if he is, he's really kind of like weirded out by what's going on in this encounter with Jesus and this man that the whole town's rejected and sent away. Or he has no idea, then all of a sudden, all of his pigs start acting crazy, like Cujo crazy, like Stephen King Cujo crazy, running down the steep bank and drowning themselves. And he's standing over the staff like, this poor, non-Jewish fool is out 2,000 pigs worth of financial income. Just like that, okay? So his position is, what the heck is going on here? This, this type of a cost is about as desirable as a wet fart in public, okay? Wearing tight white pants in church while praying. Like that. You can say, ooh, because that's the whole point of what I'm saying here. It's not desirable. This is the last thing anyone would expect. This is the last thing anyone would want. And yet it happened. The herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus. They observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, in his right mind. The very man who had the legion. And they became frightened. Okay, four things happen here. And they came to Christ, which is good. That's, that's never a bad thing to approach Jesus. They observed the man who was demon-afflicted or demonically self-identifying because being possessed isn't the PC thing to identify or give anyone the title of anymore. That was a joke. Number three is he was no longer naked, which I'm sure everyone was thankful for. Because if there's a guy who's breaking chains and has that power and authority and he's living naked, it's because he wants to. All right, screaming, running around the tomb. So every time they have a funeral, they're just trying to hold off till he's gone. And then they quickly bury this person and they get out of there because naked demon-possessed legion is going to come back and this is his turf now because this is where we sent him. So they're very grateful. Hey, there's Jesus. Okay, this guy did something. Let's go see him. Let's go to the source. He's in his right mind. Okay, and he's clothed. Thank God. But number four was they were afraid probably just as much as they were afraid of legion. When we use the term afraid in approaching the presence of God, it's not necessarily a bad thing and it's not something that's new. They were overwhelmed. See, Jesus had done what they could not by simply stepping out of the boat. They had tried to confine, to control, to manipulate this man. 
and it did not work. Jesus steps out, this man runs to him and is completely removed of the affliction, but yet there's 2,000 pigs that are missing and unaccounted for. Jesus' method had cost them. Even though the man was made well, they couldn't see past their own personal loss to see the gain of having this man back. It became about them, not the other person. See, they like the idea, and a lot of times I think in life, we like the idea of Jesus showing up and healing and doing all these things as long as it's in line with how we think he should do it. But we are scared. I think I'll speak for myself. You can answer this for yourself. I am scared sometimes of the repercussions of the presence of Christ and what effect it can have and what it can disrupt in my rhythm of life. See, Jesus doesn't play by our rules. There are no rules that define Christ. It's Jesus showing up and doing what needs to be done in the way that needs to be done. Because if he could do it our way, then we wouldn't need him to do it. We'd be able to effectively implement the change on people's lives ourselves. Oh, just stop your addiction. Stop your habits. Stop this bad behavior. Just stop it. It's fine. You're, you're, You're in Christ now. Okay, if it was that simple, I wouldn't need to come to church to get that done. The thing about going to Christ is he does it for us. The demon-afflicted man was not setting himself free by going to a church service. He had to encounter Christ. And the fear of God's presence is not anything new. Derwin reminded me of this on Tuesday when we talked about Exodus, Exodus chapter 19, pardon me. The Lord said to Moses, okay, this is God speaking to Moses, the intercessor between Moses and the people between God, okay? Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day. On the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Okay, God's intention here, I want to show myself and be with all of my people. Okay, let's get that clear. Skipping ahead a little bit, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain so that you get this image of being together with God. But fast forward to Exodus chapter 20. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood in the distance. They were afraid. God's presence was coming. It was known He was coming. And they were afraid. It was terrifying. It could cost. And he said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not let God speak or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And we know the rest of the story. But I love the fact that God had planned it so that this is my intention to be with all of you. It's not to be with a certain people group. My, my desire is not to be with the leader of a church and then they dictate everything to you. We've seen how that plays out in history and it's not all that well. God's plan isn't to be with one person for that message to be related. It's to be with all people intimately. But there is a lot of times that, that is a scary thing. Jesus presence prompts a response. How do we respond to his life-changing arrival in our lives, in our moments of weakness, brokenness, sin, joy, celebration, whatever it may be? How do we respond to that? There's a picture going to come up here. Steve's going to come up of a church billboard. And it reads, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. Here's the thing. Grammar is important. One comma would change the whole delivery of what they're trying to say. Right now they're saying, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. What they're trying to say is, don't let worries hurt you, let the church help, let us bring you to Christ. But the thing is, the grammar of our lives as well, I'm using that, you know, metaphorically, how we present ourselves has an effect on how people will receive the message as well. Okay, and a lot of people need to have that desire, to crave that influence of coming to Christ, even though his presence is scary, even though it's a difficult process, but it's worth the journey.
Okay, so how will we share that? How will we show that? How will we live that? Verse 16. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man, and all about the swine, and began to implore Christ to leave the region. (laughs) As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring Jesus that he might accompany him. What we have here is two opposing views of the same situation, okay? These people were afraid. They saw that Jesus' presence had cost them financial income and gain. You need to leave. This is too much. And yet you've got the other one, the other view. Please let me go with you. I want to be where you are. But what I love about this, this is the hard one, okay? This is what's really difficult. Jesus' presence is all that man desires. So we have to ask ourselves, what what do we desire most? But what Jesus' response here to the man who said, I want to be with you, let me come with you. Sometimes Jesus doesn't always respond in the way that we think he should as well. I'll show you what I mean. Verse 19. And he did not let him. Huh? Shouldn't we want to be accompanying Christ? Shouldn't we want to be in his presence? Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. See, Jesus' plans are not always our own. Even though we are praying and seeking his presence and we think that we have it figured out as to how that's going to play out and what he's going to have us do going forward, it doesn't always line up with what we want and what we do. There is a fear and a trust factor in following Jesus, not just encountering his presence, but following and being obedient as he leads us afterwards. This man didn't ask for anything wrong. I want to be with you. Jesus said, no. Huh? Isn't that the thing we're supposed to pray for all the time? Isn't that the thing we're supposed to seek all the time? Jesus says, I want you to go back and minister to the people who rejected me. Think about that. Jesus' whole plan for this man was to send him to a people group that had rejected Christ and asked him to leave in the first place. This is one of the greatest examples of God's grace upon us. For whatever reason, Jesus says, I want you to be my followers. Come and follow me, and you will do great things because I am with you and in you. I want your ministry to succeed mine. I want you to minister in places where Jesus couldn't be. Jesus says, oh, they rejected me, the Son of God, the Savior and Creator of the world. But you, you're from here. Go back to them and show them love. Tell them what I have done. This blows my mind. Because this man doesn't deserve this. This man has been completely defined by evil for such a long time. And now he's been set free and he wants to be with Christ. Christ says, no, you need to go back to where you came from. Show them the change. Show them what happens when you step before me and enter my presence. Show them who I am and how I work. They've rejected me, but they won't reject me in you. (laughs) It's unfathomable. Even though they rejected Jesus out of fear, Jesus didn't reject his people. He sent them a worker. He sent them one of their own with a story of a life-changing encounter of someone who had entered the presence of Christ and been completely changed. Oftentimes we go and we do where we think Jesus wants us to be and do. But we don't always ask Jesus where he wants us to go, who he wants us to be, and what he wants us to do. But there's something about seeking after my daddy. There's something about seeking after Jesus saying, show me who I am. Make me who you want me to be. Send me where you will send me. How do we act when Jesus steps out of the boat in our lives? The beautiful thing about God is he gives us all choice, free will. Do we seek his presence? Will we forsake anything and everything to see his work in our lives? Even if it costs, will we be afraid? Will we go with him to places culturally deemed inaccessible? Will we follow Jesus to the people who are unsavable, unchangeable, beyond, too far? Will we seek his face when his methods do not make sense to us? 
Will we crave His presence so we and others can be changed completely by Him? Will we go with the story of hope in Christ when He sends us? Lord, right now, I thank You for stepping out of the boat. Lord, because that means You came to a place where we are. Lord Jesus, I thank You that we don't have a religious system where we have to climb an impossible mountaintop to get to Jesus. You come down and You lift us up. You come down to where we are. You meet us where we are at, no matter where we are at in life, Lord God, time and time again, and You draw us to You. All we have to do is seek Your presence, Lord, and be receptive to the impact that Jesus can have on who we are, changing us completely inside out, forgiving us, Lord God, molding us, using us, and sending us to a place where we can have impact for you that we could not go and people we could not be on our own without you. Lord, come. Even though we may be afraid, Lord, even though it may cost us, even though you may not work or send or do things in the way that we think you should, help us to be receptive to you. Open our hearts, soften our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, Lord, that we may be quiet before you to experience you, Lord God, and hear your voice and be willing to go. Jesus, thank you for stepping out of the boat. Lord, and thank you for not always doing things the way we think you should do them because your ways are far better, far greater, and far more life-changing than ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close off with a song.